All right, recording has now started. Uh, so for those of you who are on the recording, we just introduced uh, Dan Andreessen, uh, Dave Turner, and Adam Tigert. And uh, we're all part of the, the team getting things together here for Bioshock, uh, trying to, and got, here we have some just initial training, what's going on. On the administrative side here, while we get started, um, ask you to leave your microphones off, your microphones muted, unless you're asking a question, feel free to unmute and ask questions at any time or ask questions in the chat. Either one of those is fine. But, uh, you know, we background noises, things like that. Like I think we just got somebody with background noises. So, the other one here. So feel free to unmute when you're asking a question. Um, if you, on the other hand, if you don't mind, it wouldn't, I would like it if you would turn on your cameras, if you could. Uh, and if you feel like you don't want to, that's fine too. But that just helps me see faces as I'm giving the presentation. And I can see if you got that glazed look in your eyes or if you're actually paying attention or whatever. I mean, like I said, if, if, you're, if, you, if you gotta go away or whatever, turn it off, that's fine. Uh, I'm getting a, I can mute everyone. Yes, I understand that. Please grant permission for recording. I've already got, I'm already recording it. Yeah, it's not Zoom. It's just my own personal gaze tracking. Like I said, it's just getting some feedback. So if you see something and it's making sense, you know, give me the head nod. If you're like, what? Give me the strange look, you know, and that's why I just try to keep a look at the, at the screen to see what's going on. So, all right. So introducing what's going on with Bioshock. Uh, so first of all, uh, using the reactions at the bottom, how many of you say you have at least some familiar knowledge with what Bioshock and HPC in general is? If the reactions give me a thumbs up. There's raise hands. Good, that's most of you. That's maybe not all, but uh, a good portion of you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just a quick layout. We're gonna take about the first hour or so and go through HPC in general. Uh, this is not going to talk anything about Bioshock specifically for about the first hour. I'm going to use Bioshock as an example, but it, that's not really where we're, what we're looking at here. So, introduction to Bioshock. Uh, first thing we need to know is uh, how we get stuff in and out and how we log in. We're, well, first thing you need to know is, how, is to get an account. I'm assuming you've all got that by this point. Uh, if not, uh, go to the support page docs.hpc.wichita.edu. Um, we have SSH clients. Uh, I, I put a couple of these in as being noob safe. That means they're pretty straightforward. You can't really mess them up. And I have one of those here on mine. I use MOBA Xterm and I'll show you why I like that. Uh, first of all, it does both an SSH client and it does SCP or SFTP. That, that is the file transfer to get you in and out. And I'll, I'll demonstrate those here real quick. I'm going to go over to mobile X term and you can see I haven't even logged in yet. So I'm going to log in. Uh, actually, let's, let's go ahead and create a, a session here. So I, I actually took my session out for Bioshock. So I'm going to create a new session. It's SSH. It's uh, hpc-login.wichita.edu. I'm going to specify my username, which in my case is Y698G262. And that should be all we really need to know. So I'm logging in there. It asks for my password. I'm going to cheat and use my password manager from another screen. and I'm gonna paste it in there. And now I'm logged in. Now, you notice when I pasted it in, it didn't show anything up on the screen. It didn't have any stars, didn't have any asterisks, anything like that. It just goes. So now I am logged into Bioshock. Um, the nice thing about MOBA Xterm is now I have a session here that says HPC login with this name. So to log in again, now all I need to know is my password. I double click this and I'm sitting, it knows who what my username is. 
it and the host, all I have to do is paste my password in. There I pasted it. Again, you don't see anything on the screen until I hit enter. I hit enter. Access denied. Wonder if it lost my copy here. Just a second, recopy my password again. Yep, must have. There we go. Um, so that's what we need. We need an SSH client. Uh, on Linux and on Mac, there's already a terminal application built in. Uh, I also have another session here. Uh, this is a using WSL, the Windows system for Linux, uh, subsystem for Linux. This is giving me an Ubuntu. So if I'm at an Ubuntu screen, same sort of thing, except I just have to type it from the command line. It's SSH Y698. G262 at hpc login dot wichita dot edu. Did I typo something? I actually tried this earlier and it worked. And what's that? I actually have a shortcut set up. It should do the same thing. I, I don't know what I typoed there, but it's going to the same place. And again, I must need to recopy my password. Paste. There we go, and I'm logged back in. Uh, that's how we get in, and everything we do here is all command line. Uh, you notice uh, there's nothing much I can do with the mouse. Mouse is only used for copying and pasting. So if I highlight this in MOBA X term and then right click and paste that same thing, so it copied that automatically to the clipboard and and, and uh, pasted it back in. But other than that. There's really no graphical capabilities here. And that's pretty typical of an HPC system. There is some things we can do to get around that, but we won't get into that for right now. Uh, you need a client to transfer files in and out. You can see these are my files over here. This is why I like MOBA Xterm uh, as opposed to PuTTY or some of the other ones. And that is because I can actually drag and drop files. So let's see, if I wanna take this file right here, I can take and drag it down come on bring up my because i got this in full screen mode go back come on alt tab we're going to get back to another screen here explorer so i can take and i'm not in full screen mode there we are got to get out of full screen mode there and I can take this file, I can drag it down to Windows Explorer and drop it right there, uh, not in my quick access. It won't take it to quick access. I can drop it into my downloads, for instance. And you can see it, follow, it just downloaded the file and there's that file that I just brought down. That's probably one of the easiest ways to get in and out. Um, there are directions for using SCP, SCP from the command line. Uh, if you're on a Mac, FileZilla works really well for that. Uh, Mobile Xterm is only a Windows program. So we use, like to use FileZilla on a Mac and FileZilla is also available on uh, Windows too. Delete that file and go back to our presentation. All right, so the first thing we're gonna to need to know about to work on an HPC system is some basics about Linux. And it just so happens I we do have some documentation here for Linux basics. I was getting there, Adam, I was gonna save that to the end. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, 
there, there is on demand, which we're going to demonstrate right toward the end, uh, is kind of an easier way of, of getting files in and out and, and of doing logging in if you, if you just have a web browser for access. Um, this is our Linux basics page on the, uh, on, on the, on the Bioshock wiki. Again, docs.hpc.wichita.edu. This is a wiki. You log in, can log in with your, uh, WSUID credentials and change it. So please feel free to do that. Uh, we, we want this to be better. I am not the best writer in the world when it comes to like organization and that kind of thing. So if you see something here that works better, please feel free to go ahead and do that. So here is the, uh, how, how to log in. Again, this is using, this is telling you where to find the tools gives you some basics on how to transfer files in and out if you're not using a graphical interface. And we're gonna need to know some basics about Linux. Um, first thing we need to know is some of the terminology. Uh, a directory is what we call a folder. A, a directory is, a, is, a, is a where files are found in the file system. We call that a directory in Linux. So I kind of use the terms folder and directly direct directory interchangeably uh, it's just a, a spot where files are stored and if you look back here at my own you can see that I have a couple of directories here I have a bin directory I have a GPU burn directory an intro directory that's where I'm going to put my stuff here from today and a director so that uh, that's kind of a folder now like I said over here I can click on it when I'm here, if I do a file listing, which we do with the ls command, all it shows is the names of all the files and folders in there. And you can't even, you, if you know what you're doing, you can kind of tell the blue ones are folders, the green ones are executables, and the white ones are just plain files. So if I want to change the directory, I want to cd space intro, and then I can do, tells me I'm in the intro directory. So I'm, I'm looking in there now, and you can see that I have uh, a couple of files in there that are uh, executable with green. I want to tell more about this. This is, this is what I really wanted to show here, is ls-l. And what I see, I see this gives me a whole bunch of information about the, these files in this directory. The first are what we call the permissions. Uh, these, you'll see the, a, uh, the first one here is a, is a dash. That dash means it's not a, it means the plain file. It's not a directory, it's not a link. It'll be a L for link and a, and a D for directory. Otherwise, it's a plain file. This next set, you see RWX, R nothing X, R nothing X. These are the permissions of the file. What these are is these are for the three groups of people that are involved. This is for the user, the, the person who's, uh, who's the owner of the file, they have read, write, and execute, execute capabilities on this. So right now I have read, write, and execute abilities on this file. My group has read and execute, but not write. And the rest of the world, this is anybody who has uh, access to the system, has read and executability, but not write. So if you were in my directory, you could execute this file. You couldn't write over it, but you could read it and you could execute it. Now, I said user and group. That is all dependent on this part. This is my WSU ID. So that's who has the read, write, and execute permissions. Actually, let's do this too, so you guys can see this a little better. Let's, is that better? Don't strain your eyes quite so hard. The, uh, this is my user ID, and I'm the one that has read, write, execute. This is my group. By default, all your groups is your user ID with underscore users, and you're the only person in that group. And we can't change who's in that group. If you're on a, a system that you own, you can go ahead and change that. So right now, you're the only person in the group. So user and group right now are pretty much synonymous with each other. We are, we do have a way of getting research groups in here, so you can set your group to be uh, a, a particular research group. So if we had 
I don't know, a physics class or something like that. We could have, we could set that as your group and then we could change that permission so the group would have permission without having everybody have it. And then this last bit, like I said, is the entire world. This next part is how, what is the size of the file? So this is 8,064 bytes. And it tells you the last date and time that it was, uh, that it was created. So this was uh, yesterday, two days ago. Yeah, two days ago at 2.30 in the afternoon, I created this file. So that is a super duper quick rundown of users. Now, the one thing we see more often than anything else is uh, people that don't have execute permission on their files. When you transfer a file over, it might not have execute permission. So for instance, I'm going to CD, which is change directory, and I want to go to my home directory. So that is a, my keyboard is hidden. I can't see my tilde, there it is. A tilde is the name of your own home directory. So I say CD, tilde, that gets me back to my own directory. So if I look here, you'd see the same files that you saw to, that when we first got started, they are, uh, again, these directories, I can do the ls-l. You can kind of see this, that you got the D over here for directories. Uh, and pretty much everything has the same permissions, read, write, execute, that kind of thing. These don't have any execute permissions. So if I wanted to execute one of these, that's not a good example. Let's make a new file. Uh, I'm going to use nano here to begin with. Nano is a very easy file editor. And if you want to use edit files, I would suggest you use that to get started. If you're going to be using a lot of file editing on Linux, like I do, I use Vim and I highly suggest that it has a learning curve somewhat akin to a brick wall. You will, like the most common question ever asked on Stack Overflow is how do I get out of Vim? Because once you get in, it's, it's not, intuitive at all. However, it has some really nice features, especially if, if you're not use, used to using a, uh, if you can't use a mouse. Yes, Re Rexy knows the answer. He put it in there. But you also have to push escape first. Don't forget how to escape first. Um, so nano, I'm going to create a test file.sh. And I'm going to create this file. and run the hostname command. Um, these uh, carrots at the bottom mean control, so I'm gonna exit it with control X. Save, yes, file name to write, testfile.sh. So now if I try to run testfile.sh, which I do by running dot slash testfile.sh, it tells me permission denied because even though I'm the one that wrote it, I don't have permission because if I look at it, testfile.sh does not have execute permission. So I need to change that to give myself execute permission. I do that with the chmod, change mode command, plus x. Yes, that's another way of doing it. Um, And now if you look at it now, we've added that X on there. So now I can run testfile.sh and it tells me that I'm running on head node 01. Um, there's a lot of tricks to the permissions here. Uh, as John said in the chat, you could do chmod 755. What that is, this is, you can think of these as binary numbers here. So this is a, this is worth one, this is worth two and this is worth four. So I want, if I want read, write, and execute, we add one, two, and four, that gives us seven. This one is four plus one, if we don't want everybody else to have read access. So they have four plus one, that's five. And the same thing with this last group, the four, five, five. We do talk about that on the support wiki of some, some things we can do to figure out where we are and, and how to do this. Um, so let's go through a few of these commands here together. Uh, first one, print working directory. That's telling you where am I now? 
So if I say PWD, it tells me I'm in my home directory of home Y698G262. If I change to my intro directory that I was in a little bit ago, PWD. Now I have my prompt to set so that it shows the last bit here. Uh, do I even have, I don't think I have anything that with subdirectory, sub subdirectories in there, but we can, it, it, especially if you get way deep and you put subdirectories inside subdirectories inside subdirectories, you can get a lot of those in there and you lose track of where you are. So PWD is a command that shows, shows print working directory. These are kind of cryptic. These are all back from these, all these tools are written back in like the late sixties and early seventies when space was at a premium. So uh, it, it was, people were saving as much typing as possible. So that's why you have names like PWD for print working directory. Uh, a list and is LS as we saw before. And ls-lh is also interesting because it will tell you the size in human readable format. So these are only 185 bytes. This is 1.2K, which is kind of the way we think of files in K. Yeah, and Adam says also who would want to type print working directory all the time? Exactly. Um, go back. Changing directories is with the CD, change, change directory command. So we can say, we can get back to my home directory by doing CD tilde. Um, Adam, what's your WSU ID? He's not gonna tell me. All right. These are people, there we are, he told me here. Ah, I picked the wrong place. So he has this copy. So I can say CD tilde and then his WSU ID. Ah, he has it locked down, he has permission denied on his. But that is saying by putting the the tilde and the user ID. He said he just told me it's unlocked, so I do it again. Apparently not. Still have permission denied. That's okay. Um, we can, uh, but that's how you change to somebody else's directory. So if you have like a working group and you want to be in somebody else's home directory, that's how we get there is with uh, CD and tilde name and then their WSU ID. I'm guessing from whoever's permission this is that it's probably open. Let's look. Yeah. So who I'm not sure who this person is, but they've opened their files up. Uh, looks like they've done some of the same kind of things I am. The hello MP. That's that's an example that I used a little bit ago. So to be able to change into a directory, you have to have execute and to be able to see what's in the directory, you have to have read. So directories are a little bit strange on, on, on permissions. That is all covered on this page though. Uh, we can cd dot dot to get to the parent directory. So right now I'm in my own home directory. CD without anything, by the way, the, this is a, something that didn't happen in the old days when I learned, but CD without anything about it, like you see right I did above, that takes you all, that's the same as CD uh, with a tilde to your own home directory. I could do CD dot dot to go up a directory and I can do CD dot dot to go up another directory. So now I'm at the root. So this is everything on the whole file system. And so I do CD enter again, that takes me back to my own home directory and I can see where I'm at there. Uh, there are hidden files in here. We didn't show this part. So let's look at my files. If I went here, go up a directory, 
Nope, that's upload, wrong button. You can see that there are files here that begin with a dot. Anything that begins with a dot by convention is not shown. So if I do ls-al, that shows me all, including hidden files. There's nothing hidden like in Windows where you can't get to it and that kind of thing. They just We just start files with a dot and that says, hide them from me unless I'm specifically looking for it. So now if I do a ls-al, that's all files with a long listing, you can see that we have all these others like my dot batch history. That's that's file, that's uh, what the, the all the commands I've typed on the command line show up in there. My dot bash profile, that tells some of the shortcuts I wanna take whenever I first get started and so on and so forth. So there's things that like say are usually hidden from you. But you can see I have quite a few uh, hidden files and folders there. The dash A helps you on that. Working with files. This is some useful stuff here. If I want to see what's inside a file, I can use the cat command. So let's do cat. Uh, what was the one I just made? The test file? Yeah. A, a nice, nice, another nice thing about bash is that as you, what I did here is I started typing cat and I started typing test file. And I got this far and said, oh, there's probably not any other files that start with TE. So I hit the tab key. And since it's the only one uh, file that begins with TE, it goes ahead and auto completes that for me. So I said TE and I hit tab and it says, oh yeah, that's the rest of that file. It's kind of a, it's a big time saver if you're typing lots of things, especially if you're changing the window way down deep into directories, that kind of thing. So I use the cat, well, that's for concatenate. You, it'll concatenate several files together if you want it to. Uh, but cat will just show the contents of the file. Another useful one here, let's see, do I have a longer file here? Not really. Um, there was a, a, a nice, what they call a pager in the past called more. This is probably the, yeah, speed test. There we are, speed test is a, is a longer one. So this will is a, a human readable <laughs> file. Somebody's got echo on there. Um, so we can take a look at this and as you go through more, you hit enter, and it'll go down one line. If you hit space, it'll go down a whole page at a time. So that way you, if I was to cat the file, all you see is the very end because it just blows through the whole thing real quick. That doesn't do as much good. So I use more speed test out of PY and now I can now go through it. And I can say, I can go through and look for what parts I'm looking for here and I see what I want. Now I wanna go up. That's a problem, more doesn't do that. It only goes down at once. So being the smart people that we are, we create another file called less because less is more, right? So less speed test.py. And now that lets us do page down, page down, page up, and I can go back to where I was. It's a much better way of looking through an entire file. So that's a that's a useful one to know. Cat and less are are ones I use very frequently. Uh, copying and removing. Okay, so let's take this file and I want to make a copy of speedtest.py because I'm I'm making a uh, I want to make some changes to it, but I don't want to run my result. So let's make speed copy speedtest.py to speedtest dash new.py and now you'll see I have two of those I have speed test and speed test dash new both with the same size so those are identical files now so I just made a copy of the file uh, I didn't like the name of that speed test dash new I don't like the I don't like the hyphen there so I'm going to rename it so renaming is not rename it's moving so I move MV again everything really small files every, every small command names move speed test dash new dot pi to speed test two dot pi and now it changes that for me and now I've decided I don't like that at all I'm going to remove it matter of fact I'm going to remove both files I'm going to remove speed test two and I'm going to remove 
test file. RM is the remove command. And now those are gone. Questions, comments, snide remarks? Backups, what about backups? Oh, the, the dash I? Yes, we have that on here. I personally, I don't, I, I don't think about this much because I don't use it a lot, but uh, can we run Jupyter on it? Okay, can we run a Jupyter Notebook script? Yes, we're not talking about that just yet. Um, if you accidentally remove something, we don't have backups right now. So if you accidentally remove something, it's gone. Uh, we are working on that. We will probably have backups. We are working with the uh, University of Oklahoma uh, to get tape backups uh, uh, to a certain point where we can get tape backups elsewhere. Uh, basically, it costs more to backup than it does to actually have a file system. So that's the reason why we don't have backups. So if you accidentally remove a file, um, sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> I wish I could, but I can't. Uh, one thing that is useful, though, to know, because I've done this before, and pretty much everybody's done this before, so uh, I'm going to make a directory called temp here. I'm going to copy dot dot slash all the files that start with L, all the start, files that start with M. Oh, I'm on demand as a directory. Okay, so I copied all my all those files from my home directory. So I have a copy here. I changed the temp, and I have a copy here. Now, uh, let's say I was wanting to remove files. We use what's called wildcards. So I can say rm m prime star, and that's going to remove all the files that start with m prime. So that file and that file and yes uh samuel asked if you wanted to if you actually want to remove a file you just specify a directory yes we can specify a directory and as a matter of fact the dot is a shortcut for the whatever directory i'm in so actually the last thing i put on there was move it copy all those files to here mv would work exactly the same way so i could move it from all those files to here i was wanting to make a copy this time instead of moving it but you can do that the same way so we use wildcards and we re removed m prime star. And now it removed just those two files. If you compare what was up here, you'll see it's just missing those two files because it deleted all the files that started with m prime. Are wildcards the same as regular expressions? Very similar. Um, regular expressions are, will do a little bit more than just plain wildcards. Basically, you're limited just to the star and the dot in, in for wildcards. So what I see, though, I'm going to recopy those files from trip before. So now I'm back to where I had it. I'm still in my temp directory. I want to make sure I do that because I don't want to screw this up. So I'm still in my temp directory. I have all those files that I had copied from before. And let's do the same thing I did before. I want to remove those M prime files. So I said RM M prime space star. I, we see people do this. This is probably the biggest mistake we see people make. What that's doing is that's saying remove M prime and then remove star, which is remove everything. So now I have no more files left. That's a very good, very good uh, explanation of that, Mo. Bash uses uh, blobs, which has a similar syntax. So make sure when you're removing things with wildcard, be really careful if you need to move things one at a time, or you might want to use uh, a tool like this where I could select those files and I could right click and say, delete those. 
uh, it might might be better for you uh, if you use a graphical tool, that kind of thing. And Adam just posted a link in the uh, in the chat for uh, lobbing references. Now I want to remove the directory itself, so RM can't just remove RM. You have to RM DIR for remove the directory. And now I'm back to where I was before. Uh, again, nano is uh, what we wanted, what we uh, use for editing files to begin with. If you'll see me do it, you, you probably just because I'm used to it, I'm going to try to remember to use nano when I'm here. But if I'm going to edit a file, I'm going to use bi. So uh, if I was to edit a file, I'd be using this. It looks a little different. And uses kind of a strange syntax, but like I said, if you're going to be used, doing a lot of editing. Now, a nice thing about Mobile Xterm is you can actually edit files straight from here. So this local.txt, I don't even remember what I did with that, but I can say open with the default text editor. And it actually downloads a copy to my machine. Oh, good, it's nothing I need. So I can type new stuff in here, blah, blah, blah. And I say, save it. It asks me if I, it says it's been modified. Do you want to re replace the remote file? Yes. And now if I look at local.txt, it's got that blah, blah, blah at the end of it. So mobile externals also has a built-in file editor. That might be more useful for you if you're, if you're on, on Windows. Uh, your path is a, is a, another thing that's really useful to use. Uh, your path is where I'm going to look at files when I when I go to execute files. So if I echo if I look at my path right now, which I can do by saying echo path, that's going to tell me everywhere that when I when I type a command when I type, for instance, uh, Python. Where does that look for Python? I'm going to quit it. Quit. It's always silly things like that. So that's going to look in my own bin directory because I put that, I, I told it to use that one. It's going to look in user local bin. It's going to look in user bin, user local S bin, and user S bin. Those are the default file locations. Except for this one, this one I added on myself, but all the others are. Uh, are the defaults. So if I wanted to run mprime.sh and I type mprime.sh, people on Windows are used to being able to do this. I'm in that directory. I run it and it says that I'll, I didn't find it. So that's kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, what we're going to do is we have to tell it explicitly to run from the current directory. So we do is we tell it starting with the current directory, which we said the current directory is a dot slash mprime.sh. And now I'm going to quit it because it's going to run a lot more stuff than I want to run on on a head node right now. Mprime is just a, a is a, a Mersenne prime generator. It's a, it's a good test for, for speed of a of a how much work you can get out of a CPU. So I, I use it when we want to uh, when we want to test things out and, and kind of torture test things. Um, you can edit your bash RC or your dot profile and, and change those paths in there. We'll talk a little more about that when we get to modules, which we're probably getting close to here. Uh, file transfers, file management. Bash, permissions. Okay, good, we covered all those. You can tell I kind of sort of follow my outline, but I don't pay a lot of attention to it. So supercomputing. In general, that's kind of a, that, that was kind of Linux in a nutshell. So now supercomputing. So this is the time for your mics to come on. You can tell me what defines a supercomputer. Dan, no telling. 
you're, you're the I get this from you, so you can't you can't tell. Somebody tell me what's a supercomputer? What defines a supercomputer? That's a question you guys are supposed to give me answers. Terrence, can I pick on you? You've been a, you've been on a supercomputer before. What defines a supercomputer? You might have, you told me I had somewhere else to be. You might have ducked out. Your multiple nodes can do parallel processing. That that's a piece of it. Uh, supercomputers really are defined by big and fast. <laughs> that's that. I mean, really, it's. It's whatever the biggest, fastest computers that are around right now. And the way we do that is, is like I say, by, by using multiple nodes and, and that kind of thing. But uh, supercomputers, when we talk about you know, like the big supercomputers, when I go to the supercomputing conference and we talk about the top 500, which is the fastest 500 computers in the world, I mean, Bayocat hasn't even made the top 500. And it's 10 times bigger than Bayoshock. Um, so it's... We're, they're talking massive, massive parallelization. Uh, you're having multiple computers working together as uh, as one. So our definition of what a supercomputer changes, it, what, a, what a supercomputer is, that our definition changes all the time based on the current time. So I like to tell the story of back when I was in the middle school, the Cray 2 was the fastest computer in the world by a long ways. And it was the world's fastest supercomputer. And now we have an iPhone 3, which has about the same amount of processing power as this, as the Cray 2. Doesn't seem real impressive as far as computing power anymore. So you wouldn't want to run any real calculations on it because it's not too impressive as a supercomputer anymore. Uh, what types of problems are solved by supercomputers? Go ahead, tell me what, tell me what you guys' research areas and what you're going to be using your supercomputers for. I'll be running the Abacus. Abacus, what, what does that do? What, what kind of is problems it, is that solving? It's a finite item package. Okay. Two what else? Structural problems. Uh, somebody put LS Dyna for simulations. Can we run analysis modeling programs like Comsol? Yes, we actually have Coms. We, we, I thought we had Comsol. Do we have Comsol, Adam? We don't have no, the about it yet. If not, we if not, it's no, okay. So we have it on Bayocat, which means that with licensing information, we can get it on Bayoshot. So we know how to make it happen. We just haven't yet. Uh, 3D computer, 3D computing on model. Yes. Uh, Oklahoma uses theirs a lot for weather forecasting. Uh, we have people in Nebraska do stuff with the Large Hadron Collider. They're doing physics modeling. Yeah, somebody, somebody put in the chat there. You can run software as long as you have a license for it. Bioshock will not provide licenses. We don't have, we don't have budget for licenses and stuff. Um, so we have chemistry modeling. We have molecular uh, analysis. We have uh, DNA sequencing and genomics research. All sorts of things, uh, molecular dynamics, fluid dynamics, all those things we are the kinds of things that we uh, do on supercomputers. How big can you go? Anybody know how many cores are in the biggest supercomputer in the world? No, over 10 million cores. I don't even have any idea how do you start programming for 10 million cores. That's, that's ridiculous. But one of the differences between uh, a typical supercomputer and what we do here is that when you run a computer on your own machine or run a code on your own machine you want that to be interactive you say go and your computer starts working on it in, an, in a high performance computing situation we're looking more at what we call batch instead of saying go do this now you say i need this many resources fit me in when you can so uh, let's say I have a job that takes eight nodes and it's going to last a week. So I tell the scheduler that and the scheduler fits, figures out a good place for me to fit, for, for fit my job in among all the other people. Now, right now, Bioshock is pretty empty. So we're okay right now. If you submit a job for eight nodes right now, you'd probably get in pretty quick. I can tell you that if you submitted a job that big on 
Bayo cat on our system at K-State, it would probably be a week or so before you could get, get that many resources together. And so it trying to fit, it, the scheduler's job is to figure out when is the best time that I can get all these resources together. And can I fiddle in a whole bunch of smaller jobs as opposed to the big jobs? Now, supercomputers and high performance computing in general is meant to do those one big jobs, meant to do very parallel jobs. You might use, you know, 50 machines at once if you're running something big at, at TAC or something like that. You can, TAC is the Texas Advanced Supercomputing Center. Uh, Computing Center. It's the biggest academic supercomputer in the world. It was about four years ago, I got to go uh, visit it. It's an impressive facility. I think they have 180 racks in just one of their supercomputers. It's ridiculously huge. Um, but they're made to run all those uh, those very large simulations uh, very quickly. What we actually see on Beocat is somewhere about 80% of our jobs are actually very small. They're running a small amount of resources. Uh, they're just doing a whole lot of them. So param doing parameter sweeps in R is probably one of the biggest things, sometimes Python, where you're running a whole, whole, whole bunch of smaller jobs instead of one big job. There's nothing wrong with doing that. We do have other resources. If you're doing those few hundred thousand things and it looks like it's gonna take a long time, even on Bioshock, uh, we can get you hooked up with Open Science Grid, something like that to maybe even offload that a little bit more. So that's just something else to, to think about. Um, but there's nothing wrong with submitting lots of small jobs either. Uh, you know, if you're working on your own laptop, running one simulation might take 20 minutes, but if you're running 100,000 of them, that's gonna take a while. So if you can spread those out over a lot of quarters, you know, on Bioshock, so much the better. That's what it's here for. It's a resource for that uh, purpose. Parallelism. Uh, I'm got to get. I forgot how far I was going through here. So par programming is hard, and pro parallel programming is hard. I'm going to I'm going to go through a few programming examples, not because I'm expecting to teach you guys programming. That's way beyond the scope of this, but just so you guys have, a, have an idea uh, of how this all goes together. Uh, parallelism is how many things you can have it doing at once. And I'm going to emphasize this, no system can make your, magically make your programs run in parallel. Uh, if your code is not written to run in parallel, it won't run in parallel, no matter what system you throw at it. So we've had people you know, asking for ridiculous amounts of resources on Bearcat so their stuff would run faster, and they find out that it only runs as fast as it does on their laptop because it wasn't ever written to, to be in parallel to begin with. So here's some parallelism examples. Uh, some math problems. We're doing some very basic math here. Uh, given a to the n. Ah, dang it. Uh, if we say b of n is 4 a n, is that how, how hard is, or how easy is that to parallelize? Again, this is like ask questions, you give answers. How easy is that to parallelize? If I, uh, could I put this on multiple machines? Could it, and give it a range, could it do that pretty easily? This means yes, this means no? Yeah, because it doesn't matter what your A is, it doesn't matter what your A is, your, B, you can compute that completely independently of what, what A is. So I don't need to know any other A besides the one I'm working on to know what this value of B is. Here's a lot more complex example. I just started making up things here. But you have, again, this, this final value you're looking for is some function of A of the N, A of N, A of N, A of N. So even though it's a lot more complex, it still is very easily parallel. They're, these are programs that we call embarrassingly parallel is the terminology we use because it doesn't matter. You, there's really nothing we need to do with it. We could take any set, we could run it anywhere, we could throw it back, then we have our grid done when we're finished. We can know what all our Bs are once we throw all our A's out there. Now, when we have some initial condition, now we say the speed that we're looking for is some function of A minus 
to the n minus one, that means that has to have known what the previous value is. That gets to, even though this is a very simple math problem, we can do it on paper pretty easily. It becomes a lot more difficult because on to run on the computer because you have to know the previous value. So uh, typical usage we see a lot of times is that we'll take a bunch of things that can be computed in independently. So a lot of parallel programs will run some some of these serial parts that it can uh, it can only run one at a time and it'll only run a little bit and then it'll say okay now you go do your thing and it'll run on lots of cores lots of machines at once and then it collects all that data and goes back down to just one. And it might even do that two or three times. Go out and, and out, use a whole lot, and then only using a little for a while. That's pretty normal. Uh, this is a really good uh, information page. Supercomputing in plain English. It's from uh, Harry, Newman, Harry Neiman in uh, Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. A couple of these, I'm, I'm going to put this out, uh, 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 this slideshow, on our wiki when we're done here, so you can see. But uh, why? As running on a supercomputer won't always make your uh, won't, won't always run faster. As a matter of fact, there are, it is quite plausible that sometimes your laptop will be running faster than on a supercomputer for an individual run. Uh, a lot of times, laptop chips are even faster than what we have for an individual core. They can't run as many of them as once, but any particular one job that you're doing might actually run faster on your laptop. And there is a virtual tour of a data center. Uh, at, at that link again, I'll put this on the wiki when we're done. So uh, I'm going to do again. I'm going to go through basic, basic, basic parallel uh, programming here, just so you guys can understand this. Back in my day, this is when I was an undergrad, this is the only thing you could do. It makes a complete uh, duplicate of all address space and makes new processes. It's a pain in the butt. Don't do it if you don't have to. <laughs> but for programming now, these are what we look at. We look at uh, parallel programming as uh, OpenMP is uh, is one of the most common ones we do out there. Uh, I'm going to just make, I even have this, I think somebody else had it out there, the OMP hello. So I'm going to intro. OMP hello.c. So first thing I need to do to compile this is I need to uh, load a module, so I have programming tools. Module load GCC. Actually, do I need to open MP? See if I remember this. Caps. There we are. So I now have loaded this. Now, what's interesting about that is remember I looked at our path. There's a lot more in there. So it, it knows where to find the software now. So GCC dash F open MP, OMP hello dot C. And now I have a file there called a dot out. And if I say a dot out, if I, let's look at this real quick. This is a one page program here. It says, do all these things in parallel. It's going to get the thread number. It's going to say, hello world from thread, whatever. Uh, only the master thread does this. So if you're, if it's zero, then it prints the number of threads equals whatever. So now I do dot slash a dot out. And you see, it says, hello world from thread and all sorts of numbers. Are those in order? No, they are not. They come in whatever order they just happen to be executed in. And if I do it again, it's not going to be the same order. So watch the screen and different numbers this time. The number of threads is 72. Now, where did that 72 come from? Because we have 36 cores on this box and we have hyper threading turned on. So uh, OpenMP says, oh, you have 72 cores available. When you're running on Bioshock, you don't want to have the whole thing available. So what we can do is we can just say OMP num threads equals four dot slash a dot out. And now it, you've told it only use four threads. So now it has zero, one, two, and three. 
and again, non-deterministic in how and when those all come back also. The reason I say that is because a lot of these th times you'll be asking for a, a lot of codes that you're using will be using OpenMP under the covers. And you have to tell it to use the same number of cores that you have available. So I've only requested uh, four cores and it tries to use all 36 that are on the box. That's not gonna work out really well. So I have in here Uh, some quick little code that you can do. We can say export this. We can say in our shell script that we submit, and this is getting a little, get, it's hard to know where to, where to say this is Bioshock specific and this is uh, supercomputing in general. So I'm gonna do this right here. If I, OMP example, I can either say export OMP num threads equals 10, And I can sbatch OMP example, submitted the job. Since there's probably nobody on there, I'm guessing it's done. So now it's, I said, tell me there's 10, they use 10 threads. If I'd use the other way here, this is kind of slick. This is just some quick stuff I put in my shell script beforehand. Is I look for a variable called Slurm CPUs on node. That's how many that's how many cores you've requested. And I'm saying if it doesn't exist, then sub to otherwise set the OMP num threads as as the number of cores that I've asked for. What that makes it slick is that if I run it on a head node where I don't have that, I have two. But if I do sbatch uh, uh, I forgot the right terminology here. CPUs equal 10. CPUs per task, there we are. I can type. I submitted that job. And now it used 10 because I asked for 10 threads. I could ask for 12. Actually, let's ask for five. And now it had five because it's saying it matched that OMP num threads, which is a it's an important environment variable to, to to define to whatever I asked for. So that way I don't have to think about it anymore. I can I can try scaling it up, scaling it down fairly easily. Uh, MPI again. I'm going to make this real quick. I'm not even going to have an example of this. MPI is how we talk between. Uh, different nodes. So if you're going to have something that runs over more than one node, OpenMP will run multiple cores on a node. MPI will run across different nodes. The message passing interface, it's a, it's a, it's a spec. There's multiple implementations of OpenMPI. The most common one is OpenMPI. I'm not going to go through this stuff. This is blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, so yeah. Why, what we get about uh, with MPI, with going mach between machines, is that uh, we can have people on Fortran and C and Python and R all have implementations of MPI because it's a spec, it's not a particular program. Uh, you can have interaction among different machines, you can collect data, and you can scale data really well. Uh, it is much more difficult to get, program to get started uh, programming on that end of things. Again, I'm not trying to turn you guys into programs. This is what has to be going on really under the covers for any uh, program, any codes you're running that, that'll run multiple nodes. So that's why one thing you need to find out, especially on your commercial codes, is find out if they're running an MPI so they can run on more than one machine at once, because that's where we really get the advantage 
of running of having all these nodes at once on Bioshock. Uh, not efficient for small amounts of data, so usually they're working with really big data sets, really big problems. Coding again is complex, and we now have OpenMPI, which is an MPI implementation. Um, don't confuse it with OpenMP. OpenMP is multiple processing. MPI is message passing interface. We have both on our system, OpenMP and OpenMPI. So try to just make it as difficult as we can for you guys. Uh, queuing systems, we talked about the scheduler uh, that is trying to figure out uh, where to put things. And uh, when you centralize those resources, that makes them available to everybody. Uh, that if you buy into a big system, it turns out that the expensive part about running a supercomputer is not the hardware. It's having Adam and I there to figure out what's going on and to, you know, keep security patches up to date and keep your software going and that kind of thing. And when you hand your keys to a grad student and he graduates and now nobody knows how to run the system anymore and that kind of thing. So it's, it's a lot more beneficial to, we found for a lot of people on our campus to buy into one big central resource than to have separate ones. Now, let's take about a five minute bio break. Uh, I've been talking for a long time here. We'll just do this. We'll make a five minute timer here. Go take a take a break, get away from the camera a bit if you want. Uh, I might stick around here if you want, but uh, let's go stretch your legs, get a cup of coffee, whatever you need to do at this point. And we'll be back in about five minutes. And if anybody wants to turn on the microphone, ask questions, feel free. But don't feel, as a matter of fact, I'll pause the All right, we're back. So, now we're gonna get more into specific about Bioshock itself. Um, first of all, we already mentioned the wiki here. Use that as a wiki. Please improve our documentation. We would love it if you improve our documentation. Um, how to get an account. That's the very first link you see here beyond the what it is. So you need to get an account at this uh, thing. Click what was in the chat. So that, if I'm assuming most of you guys have accounts at this point. If you don't, it's pretty easy to get one. There's a committee that determines mm. to get the, all that kind of thing. Can you clarify which software we have on Bioshock and how they can get their software installed? Okay, so we can go over that real quick. Um, let's go back here. And what you can do is you can look at module avail. Module is how we load software on there and you can see all the software that we have so if it's listed here we have it if it's not we don't um, so here's some ones we've asked people have asked about Scalapack, SciPy, TensorFlow, uh, Gromax is on there, uh, HDF5 I know people use that graphic stuff, Java. So if you need software installed on there, um, again, on the wiki, oh, wrong one, from the wiki, uh, there is installed software page right here. And this talks somewhat about the, the tool chain that we just talked about. Um, Java, Python. There's some special things to do with uh, Python in particular. So if you're going to use Python, that's that's a really useful thing to go on to here. But at the bottom, there's a thing on licensed software. Uh, two things we have to have for licensed software. First of all, we have to have the install media uploaded to Bioshock. We don't, you know, we can't install software unless we have it. You know, whether that's your the DVD, an uh, image of the DVD, or if they send it up in a tarball or something like that, we have to have a copy in there. We need to know where you saved it and we need to know about your license server. We don't provide any licensing. So what you do is just send email to HPC Help. I think HPC Help is on pretty much every page on this wiki. I know it's at least on the front page on how do I get help. Uh, mail us, 
at the HPC help at canran.net. So that's that's your one stop shop for email support. Uh, feel free to email, you can email from anywhere in the world to that address. So uh, if you have questions about it, that'd be the place to ask. Uh, logging in, we already talked about that. It's the, uh, the using the SSH client, MOBA Xterm, or a, a terminal session. Putty on Windows, so Putty tends to be the most common one used on Windows. Uh, I don't find it as user friendly as MOBA Xterm. So I don't use it as much. I, I, when I first started, I, I used Putty for years and years and years, and then MOBA Xterm came along, and I said, why would I want to go back to Putty after that point? But those are the, uh, the ways we get into running your own toolkits and running jobs on the head nodes. Okay, running toolkits. That gets to be back to where we were before. This is, what was he complaining about? Nothing, okay. Um, and Dan just texted me. He said he uses uh, Putty and when SCP. There's a lot of people that still use Win, that you still like Putty. Personally, I like uh, Mobex term more. But again, whatever works for you. That's the nice part about it. Um, somebody did. Uh, we were talking about some accessibility issues. Apparently, Mobex term is not friendly for the uh, the seeing impaired and such, the screen readers and all that. Didn't know that. First time we've ever come across that. And Putty does a lot better with that. Um, so running your own uh, toolkits. If you're in compiling software, you saw what I did er earlier, uh, how I loaded up uh, modules. So module avail will show all the available modules. And when you load a module, it lets you run the programs already pre-compiled, already set up right for Bioshock, uh, ready to go for you. So there's lots of them we already have. The ones you'll see probably most common are, if you're running your own, back over there again, I hit the wrong button. FOSS and FOSS CUDA, that's free and open software, free and open source software, and GCC. GCC is, a, is the GNU compi compiler suite. Uh, those, if you're going to be writing your own software, are, are really useful. And that's what I did whenever I compiled that program I did a little bit ago, is I loaded GCC. If I look at now module list, I loaded GCC, but when it loaded GCC, it said, oh, to load GCC, I need GCC core, I need Zlib, and I need bin utils. So it automatically loaded those. If I want to start over again, module purge. Now I do module list and all those things go went away. And also, since I did that module purge, if I look back at my path again, you notice I'm back to the basic ones that I started with. So that's one of the nice things modules do really nicely for uh, getting stuff, getting, getting programs loaded in, out cleanly, all that kind of thing. Uh, I'm guessing probably very few of you are going to be writing software. If you are, you're probably going to do it in probably Perl or Python or Java or R. And we do have sections of that on the wiki under our installed software. Those are the most common ones that we see people using. And every one of those has a section on here of how to run those jobs because some of those can be a little bit tricky, some more than others. Uh, so you can, you can feel free to take a look at that if you're creating your own software. I'm guessing that's probably not the majority of you. Most of you are just wanting to run, to run your own software. Again, if you have more software that you want, want to have on there, send us email. If it's commercial software, you'll have to upload it also. Um, and Adam does mention in there, uh, oh, okay, there was a question and an answer. Does someone involved with Bioshock write the module files to these modules? Are they available in a public repository? And we, we use easy build. We can build our own easy build files. Generally, we try not to. Um, so if, if, the, if there's an easy build file for it, 
that makes it pretty easy for us. So if you just do a Google search for easy build and the name of your software, and if that exists, then getting it installed is probably going to be a going to be pretty easy. Running jobs on the head nodes. Now, head nodes are meant for light prep work. So we don't mind, and as a matter of fact, we prefer if you're doing small amounts of files just to do a proof of concept. Like I, I uh, did that one there. I did the, I'm already in the directory there. That uh, OMP dot slash A dot out. And you saw that I ran that. That was something I compiled here myself on a head node. Running that on a head node doesn't hurt a thing. That took a couple seconds, even if it used all those threads on there. It's no big deal. Generally, head nodes are for small amounts of data just to give you a proof of concept. I made sure that my program ran here. If you're going to run anything that takes a significant amount of data, then we want you to submit that to a job, submit that as a job to the scheduler. However, like I said, if you're just wanting to do a proof of concept, you have something that's maybe run one core for a couple hours and uses a couple gigs of RAM, go ahead and run it on the head node. It's fine. You can do that. That's, that's what the head node is for, is for those proof of concepts and from some basic small scaling. But once you get anything significant beyond that point, we do want you to go ahead and submit a job. Um, there's a couple of ones that uh, we have for modules, Gromax, LAMPS, OpenFoam. Uh, I already went through, see, I got ahead of myself, the module avail, module list, module purge. List shows what's, what you have loaded right now, available, avail shows what's available, and purge gets rid of what you have so you can start over again. So, what happens when you submit a job? Uh, like I said, we have a scheduler called Slurm, and that uses a command called sbatch. Eh, I'm, I'm trying to highlight things, and it's going ahead on me. So uh, we have the sbatch command. So I'm going to use a common example that I use quite often for uh, for demonstrating this. So, and I, that is the hostname command. So if I run hostname, that just returns the full name of the computer that I'm on. I'm on headnote01.beoshock.wichita.edu. That beoshock.wichita.edu is all stuff we use internally to beoshock. So that's how it sees its host name is headnode01.beoshock.wichita.edu. Now, if I say which host name, it's going to tell me that is user bin host name. If I look at that, that is actually an executable file. Executable files cannot be submitted as to the scheduler. You have to have a script. And a script is just a, is a bash script is just a, a series of instructions that tells it how to run a program. So we're going to use the very ba most basic thing we possibly can to begin with. And I'm going to create a file called hostname.sh. Every script file has to start with what we call the shebang, which is a, a uh, ha hash sign and an exclamation point. And then what program it's running. So bin sh, or bin bash, doesn't matter. That's the, the shell we're going to run under. I kind of touched on shells, maybe just a touch. Uh, bash is probably what 90% of you are going to use. And then it's going to run hostname. So there we are. I started the script. I'm running one program. Done. So I created my file. And what happens if I do dot slash hostname.sh? Does it run it? No, it doesn't because I didn't make it executable. So again, make it executable. And now I do dot slash hostname.sh. And it has the exact same result. I opened up. A, another shell, and inside that shell, it ran the hostname command. So now I have a script, and not just a program, and a script I could submit to the scheduler. So I do that with the sbatch command. So I'm going to say sbatch hostname.sh. And when I do that, it's going to say submitted batch job 
45280. When I submit that job, what it does is it goes in and it says, can I fit this in now? Do I need to wait till later? This is a pretty small job. So it's going to just run and I'd be really shocked if it wasn't finished already. And the way I do is I look at this and you'll notice I've got a couple more in there, but you see that 45280, that that was a job number. By the way, when you're asking for help with programs, we really want to have those job numbers. That helps us a lot. You'll see slurm 45280.out. So if I do, I look at that file, cat slurm 45280.out, you can see that it ran, that when it ran the hostname command, it actually said compute 201901. So that means it actually ran on that node, the, the node named compute 201901. That's good. That means it didn't run here. It didn't run the head node. It ran on that, that job. So we did what we wanted it to do. So we need to have, do I have stuff there? Arms. We're going to get rid of all those output files. Makes it easier for us. Um, so, but we didn't give it any parameters. So what it did is it, since we didn't give it, tell it how much, how many resources we wanted, it goes with the default. The default is one core, one gigabyte of RAM for one hour. If I would use more than resources than that, uh, it, would, it, would not fail to, it would fail to work correctly. If I tried to use more than one core, it would pin all those jobs onto one core. So if I was trying to do that, uh, the OMP example, and I told it, to use 10 uh, OpenMP threads, and I only gave it one core, all those core, all that, those jobs are gonna be fighting over that one core. So you wanna match the number of, uh, of what you asked for with what your program is expecting. The, if you use more RAM than you asked for, after you exceed your amount of RAM, it will start disk swapping which will really slow things down if you're doing any sort of computation whatsoever. It's really gonna slow things down, but it won't kill your job off until you exceed one and a quarter times than, uh, than, than, than you asked for. So if I asked for one gig of RAM and it tried to use two, it'd start swapping up to one and a quarter and it'd say, now you're done and it kills your job off with an out of memory error. If you run out of time, it just kills your job off. Don't underestimate the time. That's that's probably the biggest thing I can tell you there is don't underestimate your time. It will it will uh, it will just kill your job off when you, when your time's up. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, biggest questions we have is, hey, my job quit working after an hour. Yeah, because you didn't ask for any more time than that, and it ran for an hour and then it stopped. So we had a question in the chat. It says, what happens if you ask for more cores than are available? Well, we do have a job submission verifier. So if you ask more than are available total then it'll say, I can't, I can't do that. Uh, we have 720 cores. If you ask for 1,000 cores, it would say, I can't do that. If you ask for one machine with 40 cores, our biggest one has 36. So it would tell you, I can't do that. But if you ask, if you ask for more than, you know, more than are available right now, it's going to put you in the queue and it's going to make you wait your turn. So. Now that we have that, let's tell it more information here. Let's say S batch. Let's give it some parameters. CPUs per task equals one. Uh, mem per task equals 512 meg. We, that's a really small program. Uh, time equals zero days zero hours, zero minutes, and 20 seconds. Dot slash, I'm sitting by this H. Oh, mem per task. Fine, I'm just say one. Mem per task, what'd I do wrong there?
tell total memory. The default it uses a gigabyte. So there I've kind of told it basically what I need to have there. Remember CPU, ah, that's what I did wrong, not for task for CPU. You can tell that I don't play with these actually a whole lot myself. With that, That's Dave's job. Dave, Dave does a lot of those kinds of things. So now I created a new batch job and again, it ran already and it ran on the same node that we saw before. Now, who wants to type all this stuff every time? Not me is the correct answer. So what we can do is we can take and put these things into that same batch file. So let's copy this. And we're gonna change our batch file that we're, we're submitting. So in bash, anytime a line starts with a hash sign, pound sign, whatever you wanna call it, an octothorpe if you're being fancy, that means ignore this. So say this is a comment. That'll be completely ignored. However, sbatch will look for any job that starts with pound sbatch and it will say oh that's meant for me I'll, I'll interpret that correctly There we are. So now I have these lines in my file that start with pound s batch. And that's going to be interpreted by Slurm to be parameters that I want to use. Only one option for line though. I, I'm pretty sure you can put more. I, I, I usually put in one per line just because it makes it easier to manage. But you can put in more than one per line, I am pretty sure. So I'm writing that file. If I look at it now, I can actually still run this command directly through, uh, directly on the command line on the head node. See that it ran on the head node because it saw those things as, as comments, but I can also sbatch the same thing. Can you speak about, about how jobs are priority prioritized First come, first serves, or some jobs are more important. Generally speaking, uh, jobs are first come, first serve. However, we do have a fair share queue. So, Adam, feel free to correct me on this, but I think it's in, within the last week is what it looks at. Um, if, if a particular person has run, used more resources than their fair share, so if you somebody's been running, you know, flat out for three days, somebody else comes in, their job is going to get bumped up in the priority because that person's fair share priority has gone down a little bit. So far, we haven't even run into that on Bioshock. Bioshock. So uh, that's, that's the only algorithm we have right now. Uh, I anticipate that we'll probably move more to a model like Bayocat has. On Bayocat, we have nodes that are bought by research groups and they have absolute priority on their nodes. So because they bought it, if somebody else is running on their nodes, they get to kick the person off. And, and their jobs will start nearly immediately. Now, what happens within their own group, that's their business. I'm not getting in the middle of that. But they can, they can fight over their own resources all they want. But uh, we've had, we've had, have had people that are running, you know, many, many jobs together. And uh, they're, they get frustrated because, well, I was there first. Yeah, but you've been using, you know, 25% of the whole cluster for a while. I'm gonna, do we have different type of node types? If so, can we ask for those node types specifically using sbatch? You can, but you shouldn't have to. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, let, me, let me get to there because I think I'm gonna do this next. Yes, next thing, case stat. So Dave, who is on our group, he wrote this nice little program that has, has called KSTAT. 
So we run on our cluster and on your cluster, and we really like it. So this is telling you all everything that's going on right now on Beoshock. Um, so we'll, we'll just go through what we have here. So we have compute 2019-01 through compute 2019-16. Uh, those each have 192 gigs of RAM. We have two GPU nodes, which have same 36 cores, but they also have two GPUs apiece and 384 gigs of RAM. And then we have some high memory, some big memory nodes that have a terabyte and a half of RAM. If you ask for what you need, the schedule will take care of what of where that goes. So. If you ask for GPUs, it will only schedule you on the GPU. So you shouldn't have to ask for a particular node. If you ask for something that takes a lot of RAM, it will automatically schedule you on the machine that has lots of RAM available because that's where it can. And it will move other jobs elsewhere if it can. That's the idea of a scheduler is you tell it what you want, it tells you where to put it. You don't want to ask for particular nodes themselves. Um, so case data is showing me right now several things and we'll just go through this. So the first thing we see is the compute node name. It tells what's scheduled right now. So right now it's running, it has 36 cores, four of those are being claimed, two by this job and two by this job. And it's using the cores and it's running. That's good, we like that. It's using 14 and a half of the 192 gigs, it says 191 fiddle factors with, uh, with what's, what's available from the operating system and how we count it and all that kind of thing. So numbers might be off, but 192 gigs. And it's using 14 and a half of that right now. Here's what we see on this. This is the WSU ID of the person who's running that job. Notice that you can't hide that. So don't name anything embarrassing under your name because everybody will be able to see it. Uh, this is the name that they gave it. You can give a name right by default. It's the uh, pro, it's the it's the name of the batch file you ran. So if I if I did my hostname.sh, you'd see hostname.sh over here. This is the job number, and all about that job. So it says uh, two cores. It's running. How much memory it's using. How long it's been running. So this this job has been running for seven days at this point. Similar, this node, this node, we have somebody else running uh, on another node over here. He's running train.sh. He's using all 36 cores. And Dave is giving a tutorial real quick in the chat about, uh, about using kstat. What I was gonna show there is I can say kstat dash me dash D1 for everything I ran in the last day. So here are the jobs that I ran in the last day. You can see I ran my open MP examples. We just talked about that. We ran it with one core, you know, 10 cores, you ran it with five cores. My host name examples. I can actually look at this particular job with kstat-j. We can do this for a running or a completed job. And it's gonna tell you all about that job. So it tells me the job number, the name of it, where it ran. I used one node, I used one core, I used zero gigabytes of RAM, it's that small, and, and it took less than a second, so it completed properly. Um, let's look at this one that we saw earlier. So this one, Name was OpenMP Open MP example. It also ran on 2019.01. They used one node, it used 10 cores and a gigabyte of RAM. Again, it played really quickly. Um, he asked him that, that there's a web page uh, which shows the current status of the cores and its usage. Um, we don't really have that. What we do have, let, let's get back to let, let, let's finish up with case stat here real quick. We're get, you're getting ahead of me here. We're, we're almost there. Um, so 
case stat is one of the most useful tools that we come across. The other nice thing, and you can't tell it here, there's nothing in the queue, but you'll also see, let's see, let's just, let me open up uh, Baocat real quick here. And you guys can see, we on case stat over here on ours. Takes a little bit longer. Forgot to pipe it through less. Just gonna go through the whole thing here. So it gives the same information as you saw before. We have uh, node names, how many cores, how much RAM it has, blah, 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 all the way down. We get down near the bottom. Just collecting all the data. Didn't like my thing here. So now it shows, shows me the, down at the bottom it shows the queue. So this is what's going to be next. If you guys get a backlog of jobs, this is what it'll look like. So this is the user ID. This would be the equivalent of your uh, WSU ID. We, we have usernames uh, on our system uh, that over the person's choosing. Again, the name of the job, the job number, how many cores they're requesting, PD is pending, how long it's been there, how much RAM, uh, how much RAM they're asking for. This job's been in the queue for an hour and 51 minutes. Small jobs run really quickly. Some of the big jobs you might see in here, been in there for 10 days or more. And if you look at the bottom, it'll tell us that we have a 6,000 of a little over 9,000 in use. And with the, generally speaking, the ones at the top are the ones that are next to be scheduled. Ones at the bottom are not going to be scheduled for a long time. We do have a page, and that's what I was getting to next, is the Ganglia page, which probably answers uh, Bisham's question here. We can see on here what things look like within the last, by default it's hour. I like to go to the last day myself. So this is the cluster network, how much, uh, how, how much network traffic's going on, what the cluster load is like. Uh, it doesn't sound right. CPU. Oh, that's because we have virtual in there too. So we have 720 CPUs available. Right now, we're not using hardly any. So that's that's going to tell you which uh, when when things are busy and when they're not. Uh, but uh, since we have a web page which shows the current status of the course, not really because you have to log in to tell those kinds of things anyway and you really you want to submit your jobs as soon as you can anyway because the sooner you submit a job the sooner it gets in the queue and it'll get let the scheduler do what it's meant to do and figure out when's the best time to put those in there it's not like we need to do that okay how do you go about estimated runtime for jobs that's a good question um the there's several ways of going about that you can do uh if you if you're data scales nicely, you can take a small run and kind of extrapolate from there how much it is, or you can just ask for a whole lot and let it finish early. Because if it finished early, no penalty. If you, and and look at your past. So if you, uh, if you, if you ask for 20 days and 20 days and 20 days and 20 days, and it, and your jobs continually, continuously finish in two, then you know, well, maybe I only need to ask for like three days next time. So that's, that's really it. Ask for a lot the first time. Ask for less after that. How much persistent storage is available for jobs with large output? Is that something to be requested at the time of submission or can one redirect output to an external resource? Right now we have a little over 100 terabytes available. Uh, we're not anywhere close to uh, that. So right now we only have the one data pool in your home directory. Uh, we do have temp storage on each node. So let's, that ours, yeah. S run. 
S run is the equivalent of S batch, except it's interactive. S run fast as PDY, is that right? If I'm right. All right, there we are. S run dash PTY, okay. I'm on there. I'm, 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 S run dash S. Dang it. PTY, bin, bash, dash I. There we are. So now I'm actually running on the compute node. You can see that I'm actually running on compute 2019.01. Um, so if I look here, what was I, I've, now I forgot what I was even trying to do. HTOP is a useful tool on any individual uh, job. You can see that somebody here is running MATLAB jobs. Um, if I look, uh, temp space, yes. Temp space is what I was going to show. So if I look here at DF, DF shows the, what space we have available. So you can see we have uh, home directories on home. These these two you guys don't have access to to write. You, these are read only for Op Bioshock and Op Software. But we have we not have temp. They're not separate. Okay. That's, I thought they are separate on our systems. So this is all local disk. And if I, so we can create files in temp. And if I do echo there, it'll show this. So that's a variable you can use to, to set your temp space. That is local to the machine. And that does get cleaned up whenever we, uh, whenever you uh, exit out of this job. So if I quit here, anything that I created there would be poof, at least theoretically, and should be. Um, as far as space usage, uh, what we've gone with so far on Bioshock is it's not a problem until it's a problem. So don't abuse it and you won't have to worry about it. That's ganglia. Deleting a job, oh yeah, that's, that's useful to know too. Uh, you can, let's create a new job here. Getting close on time, we're gonna make this quick. Um, we're going to add something in here, a sleep 600. So that just says, do nothing for 10 minutes. And the only reason I'm gonna do that is Job four five nine two four. So now I can do case stat dash j four five four five two nine four, and it's going to tell me ah all sorts of things about this job. Got its job ID, uh, when it started, how long it's going to take to end, uh, what node it's running on how many nodes, cores, and memory that I asked for, uh, and, and the original batch file that I was going on. If I do uh, case stat, you can see up here that that job is running on 2019.01. I can do s cancel four five two nine four and that will delete the job. I could also have done s cancel dash u and then this, which is not going to do anything right now because I don't the job is now gone. If I do case that again, you would see that. Job 45294 is no longer running there. And if I look at Slurm 45294, it just tells me that it was canceled because I canceled the job.
get rid of all those output files that I don't need anymore. Array jobs. Okay. Array jobs are how we do a lot of things at once, especially if you're doing like parameter sweeps and things like that. So I have an array example here that I created. So here is a, a, an example of an array. Now, why would we want to use an array? An array is only gets submitted one time, but it runs several times with the parameters we gave it. So I have here my job. I'm going to, if I, if I just run this right now, array example.sh, it gives nothing because a slurm array task ID doesn't exist. What I did is I said here for my s batch command, this is not part of part of the sub, this is part of the submission part of it, is I have an array of one through ten. I told it to give it a time of an hour. That's going to be way too much. One node, one task per node, all the cores per the tasks, and 64 gigs of memory. That's probably way too much for what I'm doing here. I think I co copied this in now. Let's let's make that way smaller. We want this to run fast. And just one task per node. So I gave it 10. One through 10. And let's submit that. And I have job 45295. Now when I look at my output, you'll see I have several of these Slurm 49295s. Not just one, but I it ran actually 10 times. So it actually ran that that on 10 different jobs out across Bioshock. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's make a small adjustment here. We'll get rid of these. We did the host name before. Let's add that on the end. And let's make it bigger than it'll run all at once here. Let's do 99 times. So actually, look, these jobs, number 32, 34, 35, and 36 finished. The others haven't yet. Ah, oh, there we got a whole bunch of them. So let's see which ones, like 32 we knew was, was there. So that ran on compute 2019.01. Let's look at some of the early numbers. That ran on 2019.01. They all get scheduled on the same node. Look at that. Apparently they all got scheduled on the same node, darn it. I was hoping to get it scheduled on different nodes. Oh, there we are. Job number 90 ran on Compute 2019.03. Yeah, we could actually just look. So you see most of them ran on 2019.01, 20, several of them ran on 2019.02, 2019.03. So it actually scheduled those across different nodes at the same time. But you can figure out that with a little bit of math, if you had an input parameter, uh, you could, you know, you could take that, uh, that variable that we had, that environment variable, that slurm array task ID, we could do a little bit of basic math on that. So, you know, if we wanted uh, 0 0.1 through 10 on your parameter sweep, we could say, you know, divided by 10 or whatever. So we can we can use that to our advantage and, and use that as input 
to a file. And, that, and that's a whole lot easier on the scheduler to do that as opposed to having submit, submitted 100 different jobs. It only went through once. Get rid of all those. What else? Uh, GPU. So uh, CUDA is the module you want to do that. Um, generally, uh, I don't suggest that you write CUDA if you don't want to. But if you do, it's the NVCC is the command to compile uh, CUDA code. CUDA is for our GPUs. That's for data that you're doing the same thing over and over again. That's where that's where GPUs really shine, especially floating point data. So that's if I wanted to run this, let's go back. I actually have a GPU code that I downloaded. I use this for example. So module load CUDA. And I could do NVCC. I actually I just make. Make knows to run NVCC. And I now have an executable called GPU burn. So let's create uh, an sbatch file to use this. Uh, GPU underscore burn sh. I want to give it that. I want to say grez colon. Go back and look at my screen again. grez equals GPU colon one. And then I submit that to the queue, and because I gave it that, it's going to run on one of the GPU nodes. Might take a bit longer. Nope. Ah! I promise I actually tried this. Case that dash J. See where I tried to run this. Ah, I tried to run it on a compute node, not on a GPU node. Wonder what I did wrong there. Is equals GPU one. I promise I actually even tried this. Before I did <laughs> have to come before lines of code. Aha, uh -huh. that's why I didn't do it. Thank you, Adam. That's why it worked for me and not before. Ah, there we go. So there's my output file, and it it's sees the GPUs that were on there, and it's running some specific GPU code. Again, all this is on the wiki. And the last thing we're going to do, yes, is on demand. Yes, good, because we're about out of time. So on demand, .hpc .edu is actually how we're going to run Jupyter. That's a good question. So I'm logging in here again, WSU uh, credentials. This is a web-based way of getting in. You still have to be on the on the uh, VPN or on campus to get here. But this lets us do some pretty cool things, including Jupyter. Ta-da. Um, 
I was going to use uh, a couple different things here. This is actually running jobs. When I start like our studio, for instance, here, I'm going to say, again, you have to estimate things right, number of hours, one core, and I'm going to launch it. So this is telling me now that it's starting it up. It's not quite ready yet. And now it's actually started RStudio on one of the nodes. And now we see I have, this has been deleted, move, close this. Yes, go away. All right. So uh, I have a, an R file here. So I can go to, did I delete my R file? Apparently. I can actually get, uh, let's do, let's just get a sample. Uh, R example script. There we are. This is what I did when I was testing this out. Uh, sample. Oh, that's using basics. There we are. Here we are. Here's a basic R studio, R, R script. So copying that in there, go to R studio. I can actually just paste this in here. Boom. And you can see that it actually ran. There's my R that it ran over the side. And we can do all sorts of cool stuff with R studio. Uh, Terrence probably worked with this more than I have. Do you use GPU from Jupyter? You can, uh, I believe. If I go here and say I want to do Jupyter, hmm. we don't have G GPU through Jupyter at the moment. Okay. So, in other words, we can make it happen. It does, it's not currently set up that way, but we can make it happen. But on demand is an uh, you, we can basically run whatever you want through uh, a web interface. So there's my R Studio one. I can still go there. Oh, clicked the wrong thing there. I can launch a desktop. So this is actually a desktop on one of the compute nodes. Uh, we can see that if I go to a terminal and yeah, you can see that I'm on tw Compute 2019.01. Uh, this is also really nice for downloading software. You can actually open up Firefox. So if you have things that need authentication to download, you can do that straight from here. Um, also, under here, we can... Get shell access to the head nodes. So instead of actually getting in Putty or Mobi External, whatever, I can go in here. I can do just like I would through one of those applications. And the person who was doing the uh, uh, readability, the accessibility stuff, they said this works out really well because it's really just through your browser, which is good. And where's my file? Yeah, home directory. So we can also get files in and out this way too. So I could take this local.txt and I could download it or I can upload a file. It's a little bit clunkier than MobX term, but it's really not bad at all. And we can get in and do whatever we need to. And that really is what I wanted to cover. And good thing, because we're just a fair bit over time. Sorry for doing that to you, especially on a Friday afternoon. What questions do we have? Feel free to uh, feel free to unmute and ask questions. None really, I covered it that well. Or you all just fell asleep in the middle, I can't tell.
All right, I'm going to stop the recording.